Science. Engineering. Medicine. Yes, Chemistry. Physics. Biology. Humanity. Cardiology. Computer. Public health. Global. Hello everyone, I'm Gareth Mitchell. Today, Jo Haig on 35 years at Imperial. As she retires, she's been speaking to the podcast. Also in this edition, the dangers of alcohol and the harm from children's exposure to drinks advertising. We found in this particular study that children were exposed to product packaging over seven times per day for alcohol. And this builds on other research that showed that they saw around four and a half ads per day on average. Combined, they're seeing over 12 ads per day on average for alcohol marketing and gaming to help rehabilitation in stroke patients and others who have physical impairments. The Imperial College Podcast. Right, let's jump in. We're going to have some news. Hayley Dunning and Caroline Brogan are in the studio, and we're going to start with you, Caroline, and exciting news from the Dyson School of Design Engineering. Yes, so the Dyson School of Design Engineering has now officially opened. Founding head of the school, Peter Childs, first pitched the idea of a school dedicated to design engineering to Sir James Dyson back in 2014. And now they finally have a permanent home in the old post office in Exhibition Road. This was marked with a grand opening ceremony on Monday the 13th of May. Yes, well, these openings are always jolly good fun, aren't they? So what were some of the highlights? Well, the grand opening featured eight student projects who were presenting to our guests their inventions. And this included a smart office sort of watch that monitors your blood pressure and other sensors of stress and can sort of toggle the environment of the office accordingly. So if you're hyper stressed, they might play some soothing music or dim the lights a little. Another invention was a woolly mammoth toy children can play with and then plant in the ground. It grows plants and then eventually it turns into bone, bones which they can excavate and learn about paleontology. So it's kind of a multidisciplinary toy for kids to learn about the carbon cycle and the generals of, of how the world and life and death works. So amongst all the guests and luminaries and VIPs, of course, we had our very own president. She was there, wasn't she? As she was opening the building, our president, Professor Alice Gast, said the James Dyson Foundation's generous donation of £12 million. Let us create a world-leading school for a new kind of engineer who will lead the next technological revolution. All right, Caroline, thank you very much indeed for that. And you can check out Caroline's piece from that very grand event and also see some wonderful pictures in her news piece. That's on our news website. And you can even check out that rather lovely woolly mammoth that she just mentioned. Right now, also here is Hayley Dunning. Let's speak to you. And this might be a bit of a gross subject for some people. It's definitely very important. We're going to be talking about insects and eating insects, aren't we? Well, insects, surprisingly perhaps for, for us, is are actually a really, really good source of food. Already 2 billion people worldwide eat insects regularly, but obviously here in the West, we still think that's a bit icky. But there's plenty of good research that's come out lately that shows that it's it's a really good thing to do both environmentally and and for your health. So what are the benefits? So insects are much more environmentally friendly to farm, most of them. They use, you know, much less land, water, energy. And also, if you think about it, we only eat approximately 40% of a cow, but you can eat 80 to 100% of an insect. You just pop the whole thing in your mouth and crunch away. Gross. So why are we talking about it now anyway? This is imperial researchers trying to get over that yuck factor then, is it? Yeah, so, you know, when I talked about, you know, popping a whole insect in your mouth, that might make you go, ew, as it did. And that's what researchers are trying to figure out how we can get over. Because we, if we can get over the disgust factor, then we can really make use of this great food resource, especially when, you know, food security is, is always threatened and worldwide we're eating more meat and how can we eat it more sustainably? Insects may be the answer. So how do we get over how gross they are? Well... There's a lot of historical evidence that actually we can do it because we've done it before. Lobsters, now the fancy food that they are, used to be a very low-class food. They were abundant and apparently a bit gross. So they went through their own revolution in order to become the, the fancy food that we think they are today. And are there any other foods that have gone from yuck to yum, Hayley? And there's also been the same kind of revolution with sushi. So eating raw fish... Maybe even 20 years ago, we would have thought that was a strange thing to do. And yet we all have sushi in the supermarket these days. It's an easy lunchtime staple. So hopefully that will become something we can do with insects one day. 
All right, so how might we achieve a similar food revolution, a similar sushi kind of revolution, but this time around with insects? Well, the researchers have been looking at other ways that we can present insects. Often at the moment, they're a sort of novelty item. You'll get a cricket on a stick or something. But there's other ways you can do it. You can powder them and use it as a sort of protein powder in baking. You can use mints, mealworms. You can make a mealworm mint that's a little more palatable. You know, they're trying to figure out what's palatable to people in, and seeing less legs is, is a part of that. But they're also trying to do some more research with children who don't necessarily have as many of these preconceived ideas about what's gross as we do. So, And if they can start eating them, then by the time they're adults, they'll have no problem with it. Hayley, let's all start eating insects. Thank you very much indeed for that. That's Hayley Dunning. You also heard there from Caroline Brogan. Well, now, after 35 years at Imperial, co-director of the Grantham Institute and former head of physics, Professor Jo Haig is retiring. And quite a legacy she leaves behind. Science advocacy, academic leadership and an advocate for women in science. Accolades include becoming a Fellow of the Royal Society and receiving a CBE for services to physics. Jo Hake has been speaking to Hayley Dunning and uh, the first question was, how did she become interested in weather and climate? I was always interested in the outdoors and I loved the environment and my family used to go on camping holidays and so that was always something that I enjoyed doing. And I suppose I got more interested in, in the weather as I got to be a teenager. I rather geekily set up my own weather station in the garden with a max min thermometer that my dad had and uh, I made my own rain gauge and did observations of clouds and that sort of stuff so yes it's been something I've been interested in for a very long time. So when did you first come to Imperial? The first time I came to Imperial was 1976. I came on a MSc course there was a master's course in meteorology that was being run at the time. It was fantastic. It was definitely the best in the country at that time. You've been, for the past five years, the co-director of the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and Environment here at Imperial. So what has it been like to help the Grantham Institute grow? Grantham Institute has been an absolute wonderful thing to have had the opportunity to be involved in that because it has a wonderful sense of direction and clarity of purpose. But at the same time, it's engaging widely with scientists, engineers, medics and people from the business school right the way across the college with an understanding that we all need to be involved in understanding, interpreting, acting on climate change and its impacts. And I I never would have thought I'd be doing that sort of thing. I have to say my science output has sort of declined somewhat, but being head of the Grantham Institute is a lot of talking to people and not just talking to the media that's part of it but also talking to people around society who are interested in what climate change is doing to their businesses their homes their hobbies and all the rest of it and why they need to know and what they need to do about it. You're retiring from Imperial in your role as the co-director of the Grantham Institute but I'm sure you'll still keep an eye on green policies and how things are going so what do you think might happen in the next 10, 20 years, and what do you hope will happen? Maybe they're the same thing and maybe not. Uh, It's very difficult to forecast the future. I mean, some colleagues in the Grantham Institute have done this wonderful study looking at the forecasts for the integration of renewable energy sources into electricity production, what the forecasts were and what actually happened. So each year you can see what the forecast was and then you can subsequently look and see what happened. And the forecasts were always pessimistic from what happened it's always happened much much faster and that's because of when things get implemented they go down in cost and then they get taken up more and and all this sort of business that was mainly to do with solar panels now it's also happening with wind energy the costs going down much faster than anybody thought was possible so it might be that implementing renewable energy is going to be much easier or, or quicker than we'd thought was possible in which case reducing the co2 emissions will be more feasible so it, it's quite a positive picture around the world actually it just requires everybody to do things a bit faster how do you deal with climate change deniers i know some of the things can be quite vitriolic how do you decide when to engage and when to just ignore it if people write things that are actually directly offensive i don't reply i mean that's that would be silly to engage those sort of people if people write things that are sort of quite strident and make scientific statements that that i've got things wrong i'll write back to them once explaining quite why i'm right and they're wrong or you know what the subtleties are and i won't engage any further because i think you can get drawn down an alleyway. 
I've had many, many emails like that. I mean, I don't know, 100 or I mean, probably more. And in that time, I've had two <laughs> that have said, oh, thank you for explaining it. I'm much clearer now. So, hooray, 2% success rate. Uh, never mind. There must have been some things that kept you here for 35 years. So <laughs> what will you miss? The day-to-day talking to people will be quite interesting. I mean, I'll have the husband to talk to. <laughs> Perhaps other people who I'll be going out to meet. But it would be different not talking to people about climate, atmosphere, physics every day. And also I'd like to say how much I've enjoyed the, the companionship of my colleagues in physics, but, you know, around the college. And it's been a great pleasure working here. What are you going to do in your retirement? Well, I've got several plans. My husband's a historian and uh, we like to go travelling, particularly around Eastern Europe, looking at some of the historical and archaeological sites. So that's a plan for a long trip. Perhaps do some of the travelling we didn't do that we'd planned when we were 21 in a minivan or something or perhaps not perhaps we'll get a train now it'll be better for the carbon budget (laughs) i also intend to do more music so i used to play the bassoon very enthusiastically and um i've still got it and i'll get practicing again try and make it sound a bit better it sounds awful at the moment um perhaps have some lessons join a local amateur group if they'll have me do something like that well of course enjoy seeing the children i'm sure there'll be lots of things to do I mean, local sort of green activities. I'm sure I could get far more involved in if I wanted to. I think at the moment, involvement in politics per se is something I'd keep more clear of because it's such a mess. Uh, Yes, very wise, I think. Plenty of more enjoyable things to do in your retirement, I'm sure. That's Joe Haig speaking there to Hayley Dunning. And uh, you can read Hayley's full feature about Joe on our news website. Go to imperial.ac.uk slash news to find the article or just type Haig into the search box anywhere on the Imperial website and you won't be too far off. Well, now, it's not marketed to children directly, but they're still influenced by the adverts. I'm talking about alcohol and the dangers that children face from exposure to messages that promote drinks. Hayley Dunning has been speaking to Dr Tim Chambers in the business school. He's recently joined us from the University of Otago in New Zealand, where he's been researching how children are exposed to alcohol marketing and packaging. It matters, says Tim, because alcohol is so dangerous. Alcohol is associated with over 200 injury and disease conditions and is responsible for around 5% of all deaths globally. In the UK here, it's estimated that it costs the UK economy around $50 billion. The consumption of a bottle of wine is equivalent to smoking about 5 cigarettes for men and 10 cigarettes for women. And so there are significant harms associated with alcohol and it needs uh, further regulation. Wow, so it's quite extreme, but your research recently has focused on children. So why are you looking at children? We focused on children because they're at an age where they can be influenced by things uh, such as marketing, and they're particularly vulnerable to the harms of alcohol. So we looked at kids to try and see what is the extent of their exposure to alcohol marketing, because we know that there is a long evidence base that shows that exposure to alcohol marketing for children is associated with increased drinking at earlier ages and at hazardous levels. How did you do it? How did you find out how much marketing they're exposed to? So we used the novel method where we combined GPS and wearable camera technology. Uh, 168 children in the Wellington region wore these cameras or these devices that took photos every seven seconds. And so we could capture the world in which they live and we could measure their exposures to different types of environmental features, such as alcohol marketing. Why do we want to quantify how much children see this kind of marketing? Well, often industry will say that children do not see the ads for alcohol marketing and that they are not influenced by it. So what we really wanted to do is try and quantify the number of exposures that children were seeing. And we realised that other research had not been able to do that. They were able to say that children reported that they were exposed, but not how often or these type of measures are also subject to recall bias. So using the wearable cameras, we're able to actually quantify the number of exposures that were occurring every day and how they were being exposed and where they were being exposed. What did you discover? So we found in this particular study that children were exposed to product packaging over seven times per day for alcohol. And this builds on other research that showed that they saw around four and a half ads per day on average. Combined, they're seeing over 12 ads per day on average for alcohol marketing. What do you conclude from this? What would you like to see done? So we need to have legislative restrictions on alcohol marketing. In terms of sports sponsorship, we need regulation of television, print and radio. And the big one that has been left out in the research that I've looked at is actually the exposure via the internet. 
And so we weren't able to reliably code uh, the images that were occurring on children's devices. And so this is a huge area for us to try and uh, investigate further, but also to regulate because at the moment there's very little restrictions on the type of marketing that occurs there. And in relation to product packaging, we found in this study that there was no visual cues for children to differentiate alcohol from just an ordinary commodity. And this is problematic because children base most of what they know about alcohol on the packaging of the product itself. So you've obviously done most of your initial research in New Zealand and now you've come over to the UK. What do you see as the situation in the UK? Me and my co-authors see a lot of similarities between the UK regulatory environment and New Zealand. We both have self-regulatory systems and we see that they have the same vulnerabilities and we assume that children in the UK are exposed to similar levels. So the policy implications of our research in New Zealand we feel translate very well to the UK environment and we'd like to see these recommendations put into place here in the UK. One thing I noticed from your research in New Zealand is that you were calling for alcohol placement in supermarkets to change. Would you like to see it removed from supermarkets? Yes. In New Zealand, in our research, we found that children were exposed to alcohol marketing on 85% of their visits to supermarkets. So pretty much every single time a child was entering a supermarket, they were exposed to alcohol marketing and exposed to the alcohol area, which again normalises alcohol as an ordinary commodity. We recommended that they introduce a ban on supermarket sales of alcohol in New Zealand. Is there anyone doing it right? Are there any examples we can follow? Well, Australia has alcohol sales bans in supermarkets, although they've been quite creative in the ways that they've got around it in terms of they have created new liquor stores that are owned by the supermarkets that are placed right next door to the, the supermarket itself. But at least even that type of measure means that Adult shoppers have to physically leave the supermarket to go to another store, which, if there are children around, denormalizes alcohol because it isn't a separate store. And what was interesting in our research is that not one time did a parent ever take their child to a liquor store. So it sort of shows that parents are not willing to take their children to liquor stores and that this exposure within supermarkets is really just uh, circumstantial. In the UK, I think alcohol's always been available. In supermarkets, we've never had state liquor stores or anything like that. So if we can't change that legislation, what can we do? Is there something we can do about labelling or anything like that? With labelling, we can introduce health warnings that denormalise alcohol as an ordinary commodity. We really do need effective health labelling on these products, uh, not only for children's sake, but for adult consumers' sake. Because uh, recent surveys have shown that there's very little consumer awareness about the links between alcohol and cancer, for example, and even the nutrient profile of these products uh, in terms of the calories. For some reason, alcohol is allowed to get around the normal regulations on food labeling. So increasing the, the health warnings uh, and increasing the nutrient labeling will go a long way to try and increase consumer awareness. And for children, give them visual cues that show that these products are not just like a, a milkshake or a uh, soft drink. What are you studying here in the UK? So at the moment I'm working on a European Commission funded project called STOP and it's to try and find effective interventions to try and curb childhood obesity in Europe. And so we're looking at all sorts of types of interventions that governments can implement to try and stop the increasing trends in childhood obesity. That's Tim Chambers speaking there to Hayley Dunning. Well, finally, gaming. And specifically, we are talking about games aimed at patients, like those who have suffered stroke, for instance, who have impaired movement. An Imperial researcher has been awarded funding to develop a web-based version of a social video game that could help patients with physical impairments to improve their rehabilitation. Games can complement physiotherapy and make the whole rehabilitation process more engaging so that patients are more likely to stick to their exercises. Maxine Myers has been finding out more from Dr Paul Bentley. A simple device can improve the ability of patients with arm disability to play physiotherapy-like computer games. The gripper ball consists of a lightweight electronic hand grip which interacts wirelessly with a standard PC tablet to enable the user to play arm training games. Since the development of Grippable, the device has been used in clinics around the world and the team, led by Dr Paul Bentley, has attracted over £3 million worth of investment to further develop the product. I caught up with Dr Bentley, who is a clinical senior lecturer at Imperial College London and an honorary consultant neurologist at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust to talk more about Grippable. Grippable, the hardware, is about the size of a 300ml water bottle. And a little bit like a water bottle, it's squeezable. Uh, And we made it that way because we knew that in real world, 
most of the things that we pick up and hold do tend to have a, a degree of, of flex or bend in them. And so that kind of makes it realistic. So this device then measures the amount of, of grip force that, that one can exert. But at the same time, the device houses accelerometer sensors, which means that the orientation is also measured a little bit like a mobile phone. So we can also plan assessments or exercises that involve movements of the wrist, elbow or shoulder. Now, and a third aspect of the device is that it also contains a very slight vibrator motor. We can provide tactile feedback to the patient when they're performing exercises to show that they've been performing it well or not so well. The other aspect of Grippable are the interactive games that are played on a tablet with which the device interacts wirelessly through Bluetooth. And we've now developed about 10 games which test different types of arm function, be it uh, strength, dexterity, upper arm movements versus lower arm movements. But at the same time, it's also a device that can be used by people to exercise as a form of self-physiotherapy to build up strength and also to help with rehabilitation after a stroke or if someone has arthritis or a frozen shoulder, for example. So it's basically supplementing standard physiotherapy by making it fun as well as affordable and accessible. The device has been trialled on patients at Charing Cross Hospital. Can you talk me through the trial and the results? We found that using Grippable, over 90% of patients with arm weakness could engage with the software and exercises on the tablet, whereas patients, who, if, if they were trying to play the same games using more sort of conventional control devices, the, the proportion who could engage it was much lower, uh, only sort of about 40-50% could, could use uh, standard controls. And what was most surprising was when we look at patients who have severe arm weakness, patients who, for example, can't even lift their arm up, when we put the grippable device into their hand, amazingly, they are actually able to play games such as uh, controlling a rocket going up and down the screen, which you would never have thought of just by looking at the person's paralysis um, at the side of the bed. What feedback did you receive from patients on the device? So the feedback we've received from the device has been very positive. You know, we've had young stroke patients who have said that they didn't think that they could use their paralysed arm well at all until a, the grippable device was placed into their hands and then suddenly they were empowered by enabling them to, to play games and controlling something on the screen which they uh, didn't think that they were able to do uh, beforehand. What do you think the future of rehabilitation medicine will look like and how can Grippable support this? So I think Grippable is one example of what we call democratising rehabilitation. The idea that we want the largest number of people to be able to benefit uh, from technologies that people use in their everyday lives. So, you know, we know that pretty much most people now, certainly in the UK, will have smartphones and tablets. So, you know, let's try and, and build medical devices and, and things that are going to help people, but based around technologies and devices that they already have, rather than trying to build something completely different that is going to cost them a large amount of money. Now, I know you are a Spurs fan and you talked about how you've been uh, surprised at the success of Grippable. Many people will be surprised at the success of Spurs reaching the Champions League final. So do you think they have a chance? Well, five years ago, if you would have said to me that I would have co-founded a company that's worth several million pounds and exporting medical innovations across the world, I would have laughed and fallen off my seat. So people have said the same thing about Spurs being in the Champions League final. I'll let you draw your own conclusions. That's Paul Bentley, who's speaking there to Maxine Myers and bringing this edition of the Imperial College podcast to a close. Other than to remind you that we're on plenty of platforms these days. Yes, there's no excuse for missing us, really. We're on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud and even Entail. And you get visual podcasts there, so definitely check that out. We're on the Imperial website. And I could even pop this onto a cassette and post it to you if you want to. We could go analogue, couldn't we? I'm Gareth Mitchell saying thank you very much indeed for listening. And we'll see you next time. Take care, folks, and goodbye. Goodbye.